Thank you very much for the organization of this seminar. As you rightly said, this is a very a key moment in terms of the negotiation of the draft uh, of the proposal of the Commission, uh, MIFID II, as you, as you say. There are a number of key issues which are being currently discussed in the Parliament, in the Council, and therefore it is uh, always good to share views with those that are directly following these discussions and that may be, at the end of the day, most directly affected by whatever comes out of the negotiation. Um, it is also a good initiative to have different perspectives and different views uh, about this subject. I'm sure that there are more than two or three views uh, on each of the issues that we are discussing. And um, I look forward to the conclusions of today's discussions and a debriefing on what are the main conclusions that have been reached or what are the main point of view of views that, that have been expressed. Now, um, as you rightly said, there are critical issues at stake in the negotiations, in the ongoing negotiations in the Council and the Parliament. Uh, key issues from the perspective of the well-functioning of markets, transparency, efficiency, the protection of investors, the international competitiveness of the European Union for issuers, for investors and for investment firms. So there are indeed very important issues that are related to the, um, to the negotiation of MIFID whose overarching objective has been to further the integration, competitiveness and efficiency of EU financial markets, whilst at the same time ensuring a high level of investor protection. Of course, these were also the objectives of MIFID I, and they remain uh, common objectives. Uh, we think that MIFID I, as we uh, say it very often, has been a, a history of success, and we have achieved uh, very good things in terms of efficiency, in terms of, of growth of the financial markets in Europe. But we also think that uh, MIFID I uh, has uh, shown some weaknesses that have been uh, shown most uh, dramatically uh, because of the crisis. And therefore, that we needed to revisit some of the basic rules in order to ensure that there is a safer, sounder, more transparent and more responsible financial system which works for the uh, economy and society as a whole, as you said, Etienne. This is why two of the key objectives of the review of the MIFID is to increase investor protection and to improve the functioning of the European capital markets from this perspective, and in particular to protect small investors, which has been and continues to be at the heart of the Commission's priorities and policies. And that's why our proposal includes a number of measures to try to increase this investor protection, notably one that you mentioned, the ban of inducements for firms providing independence adv advice which at the end of the day tries to ensure that an independent advice is actually independent and not as is uh, currently the case, that there are a number of incentives uh, that may change the uh, orientation or the advice that is given to this client at the end of the day. The second objective, uh, objective of the review in these turbulent times and with banks having to go uh, through a delicate uh, deleveraging exercise is that uh, Europe in European investors and businesses are able to rely on efficient and transparent capital markets for the purposes of issuing and for the purposes of investment. Pressure is growing to, uh, so that regulators ensure that there are robust and transparent security markets which are prepared to meet the rising demand from capital that we need in order to face the challenges ahead in terms of the large investment needs of the European economy to face challenges such as aging, such as uh, the greening, such as long-term investment in infrastructures, or just to recover a safe and, and stable path to growth in Europe. The primary function uh, of these capital markets, together with primary markets, uh, the, the capital function of secondary markets, is to finance the real economy, and we should not forget this uh, prime objective. So we have to ensure that markets are transparent, efficient and liquid. But what does this mean uh, in concrete terms? When we say fair markets, we mean that the best prices should be accessible to all market participants at the latter should be protected from abusive behaviour. When we talk about transparent markets, we mean that information and orders are ex and executed transactions should be made publicly available in order to, to reduce the information asymmetries, which are one of the main characteristics of these markets. When we talk about efficient markets, we mean that the price formation process should reflect the fundamental value of the traded instruments and lead to a good allocation of capital that best serves the economy. When we talk about liquid markets, we mean that market participants should be able to sell and buy assets within a reasonable time frame, in a safe and orderly manner, and with minimum market impact. 
Bearing in mind that fair, transparent, efficient and liquid markets should go hand in hand with competition on a level playing field between market participants. You have, a, a, I think, a quite a clear view about the political underlying concepts of our proposal and our strategy in this negotiation. Going beyond the technical details, this is the concepts that we want to uh, ensure are fulfilled and protected in this legislation. Now, how do these objectives translate into the MIFID review? I'll try to go very briefly through some of the key features that explain uh, how this vision is translated into the proposal. First, with regards to market structure. Now, one of the most discussed elements of our proposal is the introduction of the new OTA, the Organized Trading Facility category, that aims to ensure that all forms of multilateral trading take place on transparent and regulated trading venues. Similar trading practices should be governed by similar rules and be subject to strict transparency requirements. This has a lot to do with level playing field, this has to do a lot with transparency, with protection of the well-functioning of markets without having a segmentation, a fragmentation of markets that ultimately does not ensure efficiency as we uh, think it should be understood in these markets. Trading on an OTF will take place on a level playing field with regulated markets and MTFs and in a transparent environment. And all the three should be subject to similar transparency requirements and organisational rules. Of course, the, there needs to be a, a distinctive fe feature of an OTF versus the other regulated markets and MTFs, which would be the discretion of the operator of the platform when executing orders. This discretion element is needed to have an all-encompassing regulatory fra framework that would capture all types of existing unregulated multilateral uh, trading venues that currently fall outside the existing regulation, the MIFID 1 categories. It would, the aim is, for example, to ensure that voice broken systems are caught, although they will have to apply identical pre-trade transparency requirements. Another example of why this discretion is needed is that it allows investors willing to hide from high frequency traders to choose with what types of, or types of order flows they want to interact. It should be stressed, nevertheless, that this discretion is not absolute. It is limited by pre-trade transparency and by best execution obligations. Moreover, the operator of the OTF and their affiliates will not be allowed to execute transactions against their own capital on the OTF they operate. This is aiming at ensuring the neutrality of the platform and avoiding the obvious conflict of interest that exists whenever the operator of the platform can uh, do proprietary trading on that same platform. We think that this regulation, this, this regulatory framework for OTFs, would uh, increase the transparency in terms of the services offered and costs towards clients and therefore benefit competition competition in a level playing field within the entire market. Investors would then know who they're trading with, with, at what costs, and they should be able to rely on different execution methods to fit their own needs, but they would be, uh, know exactly what they're facing uh, in each of those platforms, in each of those uh, methods. The firm operating the OTF would still be allowed to execute its client orders by trading on own account, but it will fall under the systematic internalizer regulatory framework if done on a systematic and frequent basis. And therefore, the systematic internalizers regime draws the line between systematic and ad hoc OTC transactions, which of course will continue to exist, but in a more limited form, if we want to fulfill the G20 requirement that, uh, for example, uh, standardized and liquid derivatives are traded on regulated platforms. This is why the Commission believes that the definition of systematic internalizer should be strengthened and that these players should be subject to strict transparency requirements. Lastly, uh, all liquid financial instruments will be subject to strict transparency requirements independently on uh, the platform on which they are traded. And I know that transparency is one of the key and most discussed uh, principles um, there are very different views as to the potential impact of more or less transparency and must say that from the perspective of the Commission, one of the key features that led us to the crisis was insufficient transparency. So in general, we tend to think that more transparency is better than less transparency in these markets, but of course with the necessary waivers and exceptions. That is why we think that transparency should become the general rule, except in well-justified cases, such as large orders. I want to insist on this because many times we hear fears on, times, uh, on, the, on the part of investors saying we need uh, to have waivers because we are large players and we cannot play with the same rules. Pre-trade transparency would kill us. But that's what the large over order waivers are for and therefore we don't think that there's a loophole in the system in this regard. 
This increased transparency should reduce information asymmetries, promote competition and ensure a level playing field for end investors. The above mentioned measures taken together with the trading obligation of standardized OTC derivatives and organized trading venues that I was referring to that comes from the G20 agreements um, and that should be applied by default uh, to all kinds of financial instruments, we think creates a, comple a complete framework where uh, only uh, those transactions that should remain OTC would be left out of the normal uh, rules regarding transparency and execution, etc. A second uh, key element of our proposals, and that, that is very controversial, is the treatment of algorithmic and high-frequency trading. Of course, let me start by saying we welcome technological developments. Innovations such as algorithmic trading have both facilitated the competition that was pursued by MIFID I and helped investors deal with a fragmented and more complex trading environment. So it is not that these are negative features in themselves, but I think that we all have to acknowledge that today high frequency trading, a super fast set of algorithmic trading, has become a predominant form of, tra form of trading in EU uh, equity financial markets. Mr. Filippo now is referring to this just a moment ago. Significant concerns have been raised about the quality of the liquidity provided, as well as the, as the risks posed in terms of stability and integrity for our financial markets by this time, type of trading. These concerns have, to a certain degree, driven institutional investors to trade in the dark, trying to hide from high frequency trading, and therefore, this is a key feature undermining the confidence in our regulated financial markets. Recent several malfunctioning examples have also highlighted that these technological innovations are not without risk. I mean, the analysis of the 6th of May 2010 flash crash underline the fact that even though uh, high frequency trading firms may not have been the cause, the cause of this crash, the way and speed of their reaction had greatly amplified its effects. More recently, Knight Capital, one of the most experienced high frequency uh, trading firms, went bankrupt within an hour after having caused severe market disruptions because of rogue uh, algorithm. And only last week we have heard of another flash crash in the Indian markets. So it in our view, this shows that high-frequency trading deserves to be properly regulated in light of the size that it represents in terms of tradi trading and the spillover effect their actions may have on the integrity and stability of the market as a whole. First, the Commission's proposals will ensure that every firm that engages in this kind of trading is regulated and supervised and has stringent systems and controls in place in order to prevent abusive behaviour of malfunctioning that could create disorderly market conditions. Naked sponsored access will not be allowed without appropriate pre-trade control, controls by the investment firm providing this access. Trading venues will also be required to have proper systems and controls in place to ensure fair and orderly trading conditions and to preserve the integrity of their markets. In addition, the conditions for access to trading venues should take place on a fair and non-discriminatory basis. More specifically, the conditions under which co-location services are provided as well as the trading fee structures of trading venues have to be fair and non-discriminatory. Second, the MIFID proposals, together with the review of the Market Abuse Directive, aim at improving the detection and sanctioning of manipulative practices through high-frequency trading. The first step is to ensure regulators have access to the necessary information to monitor trading activity and detect market abuse cases. This is why we propose to extend record-keeping obligations to orders and to flag the algorithm that is behind the order. The second step is to reinforce the cooperation between competent authorities and facilitate the exchange of information to ensure effective cross-market surveillance. And the last step is to reinforce the Market Abuse Directive framework by clearly stipulating which high-frequency trading strategies constitute prohibited market manipulation. <coughs> One of the most controversial issues of the Commission's proposal, which is uh, the proposed requirement for high-frequency <coughs> traders to provide liquidity on a continuous basis, is, uh, is an interesting and an important feature of the proposal. High frequency traders uh, claim they provide liquidity to the market and are behaving de facto like liquidity providers or market makers. As they benefit from the market in good times, we think that they should also contribute to the market in turbulent times. But more important, we need, we think, to enhance the quality of the liquidity, the stability and the integrity of our financial markets. We need to properly understand what we mean by liquidity. 
Now, requiring genuine high-frequency traders to provide liquidity on a continuous basis does not mean providing ghost liquidity, as we may call it. We need to prevent genuine high-frequency traders to abruptly withdraw from markets causing systemic risks, such as the ones that we have mentioned. And we need to discipline the conduct of high-frequency traders so as to prevent them from engaging in market manipulative uh, practices. I mean, we need to frame ultimately this race to zero, no? the race to uh, speed that has become absolutely uh, incremental and that uh, has posed questions, as Mr. Filippo Nat mentioned, about the incremental benefits in terms of more efficient price formation mechanism and market liquidity. There are questions as to whether this rush to uh, immediate uh, action is actually contributing to welfare and the well-functioning of uh, financial markets, as demonstrated by the flash crash trading volumes that I, that, uh, that I referred to. Trading volumes, volumes should not be equated with liquidity and traffic congestion is a reality in these markets. This is why the Commission's proposals include measures to slow down the trading process. For example, the introduction <coughs> of an order to executed ratio and a minimum tick size. I would say that regulation is needed, but we also welcome self-regulatory actions on the side of uh, different stock exchanges, which in order to alleviate the pressure on their market infrastructure, have tried to introduce also certain limits and certain measures to avoid a flash crash uh, uh, happening again, or this excessive uh, vitesse or speed, if you, if you want to call it that way. Other ideas which are currently debated amongst politicians and experts are the introduction of a minimum resting time for orders and the regulation of trading fees, elements that we have not uh, put into our uh, proposal that, but are currently being considered uh, by different uh, stakeholders. A third important element uh, within our proposals has to do with commodity derivatives. Recent years have seen an increase in prices and volatility in all major commodity markets. Mr. Filippona has also referred to these. These increases were accompanied by gross, growing investment flows. The combination of these two trends have gi has given rise to a strong debate on whether financialization can be seen as one of the main drivers of commodity prices in the past years and volatility of these markets more broadly. There are two related questions to this debate. First, what is the impact of these financial investments on the functioning of the commodity derivative markets? And second, how do these investments in commodity futures markets affect the prices of the spot markets? With regards to the first question, there is growing consensus, I think, that financial investors have affected price dynamics over short-term horizons. The second question is, uh, on the contrary, subject to an ongoing debate. Although it is clear that there is a link between the price of uh, derivatives and the price of the real underlying uh, assets and physical markets, and they are linked in, in multiple ways, we still do not fully understand the nature and extent of these links and the direction of the uh, mutual influences. In any case, these concerns have increased uh, calls for a policy responses to ensure that derivatives keep serving their initiative, uh, their initial purpose of price discovery and hedging for the benefits of consumers and, produ and producers. The Commission has been very actively engaged in this debate in many different fora for many years and has set clearly as a key priority the improvement of the functioning of derivatives markets. That's why the review of MIFID and MAD include a number of concrete measures to enhance the transparency, transparency integrity and oversights in commodity derivatives markets. For example, introducing position reporting by types of traders based on the useful ex experience of the CFTC in, in this respect, uh, the introduction of position limits in order to preserve market integrity, mandating trading of standardized OTC derivatives, as is the case with other kinds of derivatives in uh, on transparent and multilateral trading venues. And finally, these measures are complemented by the review of the Market Abuse Directive in order to abuse that derivatives can be used to mani manipulate the price of the related spot markets or vice versa, using uh, transactions in spot markets to manipulate the functioning of derivatives. These measures, as I said just a moment ago, fully reflect the G20 work and work in other fora such as IOSCO. Let me remind you as well that uh, commodity derivatives, like all derivatives, are subject to the G20 roadmap addressing the systemic risks and opacity of OTC derivatives. So uh, these derivatives are subject to what we all know as EMIR, the regulation uh, dealing with the uh, central counterparty clearing of OTC derivatives. 
finally, finally, after going you know, very fast through the three of the key features of our um, proposal, which are currently being discussed and which are the most controversial from the perspective of the different players in the market, let me give you a brief update on the negotiation process, although I am sure that Mr. Ferber will have more to say about this in a second. There is, a, we think, a clear political willingness to act swiftly on this file, and we share this willingness. The European Parliament has voted in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee on the 26th of September. Concerning the Council, the Cypriot Presidency is trying to accelerate work. Uh, we have meetings on a non-stop basis on this file, and we think that a political agreement could be reached under the Cypriot Presidency. The Commission will therefore have to start working on the implementing measures and if we think that 18 months may be needed, we uh, could have this uh, new regime in place and operational by mid-2014. Probably the entry into force of the market abuse uh, regulation and directive should be uh, kept in parallel uh, in view of the interconnectedness of these two pieces of legislation. Now, someone told me a couple of weeks ago that in normal circumstances, if that would exist anymore, MIFID would have been the most important legislative initiative in the, regulatory, in the financial regulatory field for the Commission this year. And uh, it is true that we're terribly busy with other very urgent pieces of legislation. I mean, Banking Union, CRD4, Resolution, Bank Recovery and Resolution have taken the forefront. They're capturing all the highlights, all the headlines of the newspapers, and they keep us extremely busy. But you should rest assured that that does not mean at all that within the Commission we do not think that the MIFID review is not the top priority. By the way, we should stop talking about MIFID because I'm really happy that now we should talk about MIFIR much more with an R at the end of all our regulatory proposals within the financial services area. It is a key piece of legislation and that's why we think we absolutely have to keep it right. From this perspective, the Commission uh, understands its role as a facilitator of the trialogues and we will try to make sure that we strike the right balance to establish efficient and effective markets in Europe which help to restore market confidence and that ultimately serve the real economy, which is their main purpose. And on this positive uh, thought line, uh, let me finish my introductory remarks. Thank you very much.